Well, I hope you all are having a good morning. It's good to be back. I uh, had to thank Carrie uh, for filling in the last two weeks. Was supposed to be obviously in Haiti and coming back from Haiti. And uh, by the way, if I'm a little out of breath, I forgot my notes on the copier. So bear with me for a few seconds. Long story. Anyway, uh, but glad Carrie was able to share her heart, use her gifts. It's always just such a uh, joy to have her up here. Uh, we're going to start this new series today. Now, before you cover your children's eyes and think that we are somehow a satanic cult, we aren't. Um, you'll understand when you see, yeah, it just fit. It just fit. We're talking creeping death. Now, why on earth am I talking and naming a series after this? I am glad you asked, okay? We are going to take a look at a verse that's going to be sort of the oversight of this entire series here out of Genesis chapter 4. I'll have it up on the screen in a second, but let me set it up. Adam and Eve, first man and woman, created. Everything's peachy. They have this awesome relationship going with God. Everything's wonderful. Everything is awesome, as the song says, okay? They choose to do what they think is best, what we would refer to as sin. They choose against what God wishes for them. And all of a sudden, all the rest of humanity is in trouble. They have two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel, one day, are giving sacrifices to God. Abel brings a sacrifice that was precious to him. His heart was in the right place. He brings it before God. God accepts it. Cain, on the other hand, brings his. And the Bible doesn't really tell us if he came with the wrong heart, or he just kind of threw an offering up there and didn't care about it. Cain comes, Cain gives his sacrifice to the Lord, and the Lord rejects it. And Cain is angry. And this is where creeping death comes in. Because in Genesis 4, verses 6 to 7, the Lord says to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, Will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Sin is crouching at your door, Cain. Sin is crouching at your door. Literally, the words here is using this illustration, this picture of a beast, an animal, a demon, waiting outside your door, just waiting for you to unlock it or maybe crack it open a little bit, and it's waiting to dominate you. It wants control of you. It wants to consume you and mess you up. It, it almost makes sin sound like a living, breathing thing here. But God tells Cain, you must master it. For the next three weeks, we're going to talk about three specific areas that I see a lot of Christians, and I personally have stumbled and struggled with. And we're not calling out sins, we're calling out patterns that I've seen within our lives that are sinful. We want to know how we can master it as best as we can. We, the reality is this. You and I still struggle with sin. I still struggle with it. I struggle with anger and, and all of these things. I still struggle, but that doesn't give me an excuse to just do it. Well, I struggle with it. Why not give in? I am called to live a holy life. You are called to live a holy life. And whatever we can do to get closer to living a holier life is a good thing. Now, before we go any further, I, I, I do want to come up with a simple definition of sin. Now, if you're uh, new to church or new to your faith, you may define sin as bad stuff, okay? That's an easy enough definition. If you've been in church a long time, you might have this great theological definition that has ology and uh, depravity thrown in there, and you know, it's just, it's like, everyone's like, oh, you are smarter than us, and, and all that. But I'm going to give you a different one, and this is actually, I can't take credit for this. This comes out of the book, Not the Way It's Supposed to Be, by Cornelius Platinga, and I loved it, because it just changed my perspective a bit. And I'm paraphrasing his definition of it as simply this. Sin is a blameworthy act of breaking shalom, 
an act that we are culpable, whether we meant to do it or we didn't. We involuntarily did it. We're culpable of breaking shalom. Well, shalom is a word that a lot of us know uh, or we've heard mostly. And if I was to ask you the one word definition of what shalom means, it would be peace. Yeah, exactly. See, a lot of us know that. It means peace. But peace is a part of it, but you don't understand how deep that goes. It's complete peace. It's complete justice. It's complete good. It's what Adam and Eve had before they threw it all away in a decision. Everything was right. Everything was the way it was supposed to be. We look at the world and all the stuff that's going on in it, we're like, man, that's not the way God wanted things. And you're right. It's not. We break shalom. We break peace with God. We break peace with each other. We break justice with each other. We break all these different things. And when we make choices, we choose to disobey God, whether voluntarily or involuntary, that peace is wrecked. It's ruined. And so the world gets trouble because we've broken the peace. Sin is self-destructive. I don't know if we ever view it that way, but our choices that are sinful are self-destructive. I've used this illustration before. If if I've done it here, forgive me, Uh, but I always say it's like stubbing your toe. I don't know too many people that go and stub their toe because it hurts. Um, It happens in the middle of the night, but I don't know too many people that go, that was great. Do it again. Do it again. Okay, if you do, you need prayer and come see me after. Uh, uh, If you enjoy that, something's wrong, but in effect, that is what sin is. Sin is self-destructive and painful, and yet, like the person who keeps kicking the, their toe on the bed, it's destructive, and yet we keep doing it. But sin is also leads to spiritual death. We die spiritually. It's another step away from Christ. It's a step away. It builds walls between us and Christ. Sin is unquenchable. No matter how much you do of it, it wants more. I don't know too many people that were like, wow, you know, I told a lie when I was like three, and it was so terrible, I never have again. If that's you, you're awesome. You get a gold star, because that, uh, uh, that's not the case. When we tell one, we have to tell another to cover the, the one. It, sin is unquenchable. No matter how many times we do it, it always wants more. Sin, though, is it just unquenchable? It's unfulfilling. It promises us something, and it actually, in all reality, makes things worse. It, it can't be quenched. And it's also, it's unfulfilling, and it's also unnatural. It's not the way God intended for things to be. It's unnatural to God's shalom. It causes problems. Now, if, if you, and, and some of us have been through this, if you get an early diagnosis for something health-wise, and, and whatever that is, for me, heart, okay? Just found out, you know, I have some things that are like real early signs for heart issues, okay? Doctor points it out, they see it, all that stuff they pointed out to me. All of us, I would like to think, as soon as we know that there's that potential for something, and, and maybe getting a more serious disease down the road, we will take immediate action. We'll find out all about it. We'll do whatever's required of us, et cetera, et cetera. If I find out that I am a very strong candidate for heart attack or something like that down the road, I'm probably not going to go, thanks, doc. Hey, who wants to go to Jersey Mike's and get a cheesesteak and a bag of chips? Yeah, all right? It's tempting. But you get the idea. When we know something serious is very possible of happening, we take care of it immediately. Sin is a disease. Sin is a serious disease that has impacted more lives than any earthly disease ever has because it's impacted us all. And it's just it's destructive. And yet, when we get an early diagnosis that, hey, you're not going a good direction here, we say, oh, okay. We don't take it as seriously as we do our physical disease. And that's a problem. Now today we're going to talk about sin in one particular aspect of of 
how it develops. And we're calling this Baby Steps. It is inspired by my favorite movie, or one of them, uh, What About Bob? Uh, Baby Steps. Baby Steps, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's a classic. But I want to explain baby steps with sin and how we get to a certain destination. And really our big idea today is if you want to avoid the destination, don't start the journey. If you want to avoid the destination, avoid the journey. Don't start it. If you start heading that way, stop. And let me, we'll, we'll see a biblical example here of this that most of us are familiar with, even if, if you haven't been in church a lot. It's a story we have some general ideas of, but I want to watch how it develops, and it's out of 2 Samuel 11. Now, when I was a kid, this story was pictured by my father. My dad is a storyteller. He's very good. If you were to see him, if he was here today, he'd be sitting in the seat, and he's very docile. He's phlegmatic. He doesn't really show a lot of emotion. You get him in front of his classroom and all of a sudden this like beast is unleashed and he's like making sound effects and he's flailing his arms all about. He's an amazing man. And, and dad used to tell us as kids a story. They were missionaries in Brazil for 13 years and they, they still speak Portuguese. Dad still tries to impress people with the fact he's 78 and still knows Portuguese. Literally yesterday mom texts me. They're at a wedding in Philadelphia. They said one of the groomsmen can speak Portuguese. I was like, I text back to mom, I'm like, let me guess, dad's going to talk to him. She texts back, he already has. I'm like, yeah, that's dad. All right, he's a, wow, you're somebody who can speak Portuguese. Dad used to tell this story to us that used the Portuguese word, uh, an onça. Onça is a jaguar. And dad would get us all together, and we had heard the story a hundred times, but we just loved it when he would, would t- uh, tell us, it. And, 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 and we'd sit in a circle, and, and dad would go, baby onças grow up to be little onças. Little onces grow up to be a little bit bigger of an onsa. A little bit of an uh, a onsa grows up to be a medium-sized onsa. And a medium-sized onsa grows to be a, a large onsa. And he starts getting louder and louder. And a large onsa, a mature onsa, kills! And he would scream it at the top of his lungs. And we, we were always waiting for it with anticipation. We would jump back and he'd scare us every time. And he'd yell at the top of his lungs. And, and we loved it. It was a great story. But dad would use this story for this purpose. Little sins grow up to be a little bit bigger sins. A little bit bigger sins grow up to be medium-sized sins. Medium-sized sins grow to be larger sins. Larger sins kill. We baby step our way to destruction. Oftentimes. You've seen it. You've seen it in friends. They got someplace they never, ever could have imagined that they ever would have been. And they baby step their way there. You saw it. The destination was, was ahead of them. And they just kept taking the journey towards it, no matter the warnings or whatever. Let's take a look at these baby steps to destruction as I see them out of 2 Samuel 11, familiar story of David and Bathsheba. Now let me set it up this way. David, successful king, man after God's own heart. He is currently sitting at a time of tremendous victory, tremendous peace. There's no one messing with Israel because David's at the helm No one's messing with them. And we start off in verse one, and it says this. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. I'm gonna pause before we go to verse two. A couple things here. In the spring... It was normal that a king, they wouldn't fight during winter. It required a lot more resources and so on. They would fight in the spring. It's like, hey, it's spring. It's not baseball season. It's killing season. Let's go. So they'd uh, get the army and they'd start going. But because David had been so successful, and we see even with the Ammonites, he destroyed them, which was sort of like the last real threat, everything was falling into place. It was a good time to be king. And in this peace, in this shalom, if you will, David had it all together and thought, you know what, you guys, you can handle this. Go on out, go. And so he sends out the army, and he chooses to stay behind. There are uh, Bible scholars and such that have torn this apart, and well, he should have been with the army. I don't know. Maybe he should have. Maybe he had trained his men enough that he's like, you know what, you guys got this. There's really no purpose in me being there. I don't know. I'll ask David when we get to the kingdom. But the reality is this, that he put himself, little did he know, 
into a vulnerable environment, which is the first step. A vulnerable environment. We sometimes get to this. We have a great spiritual victory. Everything's peachy and good and great and everything's working. And, and then all of a sudden, we fall. At the time of our greatest victories and our greatest heights and our walk with Christ, we do a simple, dumb mistake. It's almost like we become so confident in how well things are going, we feel we're above ever stumbling, and in that weakness, we fall. And that's where David is. He's in a vulnerable environment. In verse 2, one evening, David gets up from his bed after an afternoon uh, nap. It sounds like it was like in the late part of the day, and he walks around on the roof of the palace. It's his palace. I guess he can do that. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. Once again, there's Bible scholars that have now begun to say, why was she there? That was very unusual to be in a visible spot. And there's some that said, was she just baiting David? I don't know. David's responsible for David, though. David was responsible for David. David sees this woman bathing, and rather than going, okay, hey, how was the chariot races today, guys? Let's get our mind out of that. No, 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 no. David goes to step two. He feeds the curiosity. He feeds the curiosity. In verse 3, it says that David sent someone to find out about her. David sends one of his messengers or whatever. Now he's pulling somebody else into his sin. And they go, and they find out all about this woman whose name is Bathsheba. Oh, whose husband is a guy named Uriah, who's one of David's 30 mighty men, uh, some of his best soldiers. He's done a lot of life with them. So it's kind of like one of his closer acquaintances. Oh, and she's also the, the granddaughter of one of David's highest counselors. You would think right there, it'd be like, oh, okay, good friend, one of my best counselors. Okay, I get it. Oh, she's married? Yeah, I'm staying away from this. No, he feeds the curiosity. We do this. Sometimes we think we're strong enough that we can get within the vicinity of sin and, hey, it's not killing me. I can look how close I can get. I'm okay. I, I'm merely finding out the person's name that I kind of had some thoughts about. I'm, I'm uh, just checking it out. It's not killing me. I, what, am I not allowed to check this out? Come on. When we feed the curiosity, it only starts to feed the beast that is unquenchable, the creeping death at our door sin, which leads us to the next step. Action and consequence. Action and consequence. We play around it so long because we're so strong and we aren't going to have a problem that all of a sudden we're like, okay, let's take a step into this. Let's do it. And so we get into it. Sometimes we do it, we're like, wow, I'm okay at the other end of it, but we're not okay. We've broken shalom. Action and consequence comes from those actions. In verse four, then David sent messengers to get her. Once again, he's pulling more people into this. She came to him and he slept with her. Verse five, the woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I'm pregnant. His action had a consequence, whether good or bad. This is a child now that is in the mix. What was something he could have prevented, something he could have stopped, something he could have uh, just got his mind off and found something else to do, maybe get on in his chariot and go join his army to get away from it. Instead, he walks closer and closer towards it, and it gets him. And now there's another life as a result of this, which leads us to the next step, early cover-up, early cover-up. Now, now it's, okay, how do we make this right? How do we get some shalom out of this? How do we work this out? Uh, okay, well, I tell you what, Bible says that he goes to um, uh, his a commander, and he says, you know what? So David sent this word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite, bring her husband home. Now, this had to seem strange. You have thousands of troops out fighting a war, and all of a sudden the king's like, hey, you, why don't you just come home? And not just that, 
But David looks at Uriah. He's like, how's the battle going? Great, great, great. That's fantastic. Hey, you know, why don't you go home to your wife tonight? Know what I'm saying? Uh Uh-huh. You've been at war a long time. Go be with your wife tonight intimately. Uriah, though, was a loyal, faithful man. See, he points out that the army had made a pledge that until the war was over and peace was there, completely, they would not be with their wives intimately. They would not sleep with them. So, he was being true to a vow they made with each other when David was not being true to his own role. You have a better example in Uriah of being faithful and true than you do in the king, the man after God's own heart. So he goes, he maybe sees his wife, but then he goes that night and he sleeps out at the gates. You have to wonder if Uriah was on to something because of how he acted. And when that didn't work out, David's like, why, why didn't you go home and be with your wife? Come on, what's going on? What's the? I tell you what, okay, let's try this again. The cover-up continues. Why don't we have a party at my place tonight? Come on over to the palace. It's going to be a great time. A lot of, you know, music, and we're going to have, you know, some games on TV and all this stuff. Uh, hey, got a couple bottles of wine? They're good. Let me tell you, you can drink as much as you want. So as Uriah come in, Uriah drinks a lot of wine. He gets loaded, hammered, smashed, juiced, whatever you call it. He's drunk out of his mind. David makes him drunk. Because he's like, his inhibitions will be low. He'll go home. He'll be with his wife. Intimacy will happen. (sighs) Shalom will be back. We can cover this thing up. Wouldn't you know it that Uriah, even in his drunken stupor, was wise enough and cognizant enough to not go back to his wife and sleeps at the gates with the guards again. Because he knew a war was going on and to him it was wrong that he should enjoy things for a season while his fellow warriors were giving their lives and fighting a battle. Now David's frustrated. As we sometimes are when we try to cover up a sin with another lie or or an alibi or something like that. Now we get to the next step. And the next step is desperation. David moves to desperation. He baby steps to desperation. Now he's in a full-blown panic. He can't get this guy to help be a part of the cover-up without knowing it. Now he pulls in Joab. He sends a letter to Joab in verse 14. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. Little did Uriah know he's carrying his own death sentence in his hand. In it, he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. Later on in verse 24, the plan succeeds, and Uriah the Hittite is dead. He gets the report. Man, desperate times call for desperate measures. Did you know the TMZ reporters were at the front door of the palace? They were trying to get some story on this. I just avoided a scandal here, guys. Let me tell you. It took some extreme measures. Yeah, it kind of stinks. Uriah was a good guy. We had some great times together, but at least I saved face. At least I can make this look all right. At least I have false shalom, which is the next step. False shalom. Because David, now, after a time of mourning and his wife mourns and, and so on, verse 27, after the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. David's sitting there thinking, I got everything covered up. Nobody knows a thing. All is good. That was a close one. I have peace in my life again. I have my eighth wife now who's going to have a baby. All is right with the world again, except for that last line there. But what David had done had displeased the Lord. Many of you know how the story uh, resolves itself. He's confronted and all the tragedy that happens as a result of this baby stepping to destruction. If you would have asked David before the story even began in verse one, would you ever just murder somebody for taking something from them? David would have been appalled as king. How dare you? I would never do that. 
And that even comes out in the next chapter when he is confronted. He was appalled at such an injustice against a weaker, poorer person. So how did he get there to be that person? One little step at a time. Sin is unquenchable. Sin grows. Sin matures. Sin always leads to more sin. And it's a battle and a disease that we are all fighting every day of our life in our homes, at work, in our world. We're all fighting this battle. If we want to avoid going to a destination that we never intended on getting to, we need to stop the journey. We need to stop the journey now. Of, uh, own up to what it is, be honest with ourselves, and start doing something about it. This is a textbook example, really, of the book of James. Jesus' brother writes this book. It's a very short one, a simple one to study, very practical. And this is a familiar verse out of James chapter 1, verses 14 to 15, where James says this, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. They're enticed and they give in to temptation. Verse 15, then after desire has conceived... It gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. We're Lord, we give in, and it leads us to a destination, and we do it one step at a time. When I was uh, in the 12 to 15 year old age, uh, I, I used to fish. I don't anymore. I find it detestable. I'm kidding. Actually, I just don't eat fish. I, I'm one of those weirdos that doesn't like seafood. But uh, we would go fishing. I would do it with my dad from time to time. And uh, you know how you fish. You have your line. You have your hook. You have your bait. You go, hopefully, to a place where there's lots of fish that are just dumb enough that they haven't learned the first time they got hooked. So you go to this uh, place, which is an environment that is unsafe for fish to be swimming in, and you drop your line in the water. And if you think of it, James really describes fishing. And let me show you why. There's steps here that are very similar to the steps we just saw with David. The first step is that fish are in unsafe waters. They're in a bad environment, just like David was. We put ourselves in environments that are not healthy, productive, good. They set us up, whether we're arrogant or not, they set us up to fall. And a fish is in that oftentimes. They're in, you know, waters where they're susceptible to being caught. Next, they nibble the bait. The bait's there. They give it a little nip. If they had tongues, which is just weird, you know, a fish with a tongue, that's scary to me. But anyway, if it had a tongue, it might lick it or whatever. You know, hey, look, look what I could do. It's totally safe. Remember David being lured in? It's, it's okay. It's okay to ask her name. It's okay to have some people bring, bring her up in the palace. That's okay too. You're not doing anything. We nibble at the bait. Then we take the bite because the nibbles weren't satisfying enough. And now we have a big old hook in our lip. We look like a punk rocker from the 90s, okay? Because we have this piercing in our lip uh, with this uh, hook. Okay, that was a joke that went nowhere. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> We have a hook in our lip because the nibbles weren't enough, and now we've taken the bite, and oh, no, I did it. So we put up a fight. We try to cover it up. We try to move on. We try to do something. We try to get away from it, and we can't. And the next thing you know, we're lured in, and then we're lured into this safe place called the cooler. Little do we know that the cooler is the next step to the, the sushi place or the frying pan. But we think we're in false shalom. Okay, the hook's out of my mouth. Everything's good again, and it's not good again. David displeased the Lord. We displeased the Lord. Sin is not content. Staying small. It creeps at your door waiting for you to mess up. It's a picture of the devil, as we see uh, in the Bible later in, in uh, 1 Peter, where the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, looking for that weak moment. He's on top of it. But why don't we stay on top of it? 
Some attitudes that lead to us falling into this false shalom, uh, I'm strong enough to resist this. I'm good. I, I, I'll never fall for that. How many people have fallen after they said, I'll never fall for that? How many pastors have I unfortunately heard fall into transgression and the sin in their life? How many leaders in general, how many politicians, celebrities who at one time would have said, oh, I'll never ever do that, and then they do because they took baby steps to get there. Another attitude might be, you know what, it's not that bad, it's not that big a deal that I do this, I'm in control, I got it. It's culturally acceptable. So what's the big deal? Another one, you know what, I deserve some happiness. I deserve some happiness with this. You know how hard a life I've had? You're getting on my case about taking advantage of people and being greedy and taking all their money. You know what my upbringing was? I was poor. I deserved this. You victimize yourself. All of these are attitudes that lead us one step closer to the baby steps of destruction. The real kicker with this is the fact that I've seen this firsthand. Uh, two acquaintances that I have had in the past, one of whom was one who did time for Grand Theft Auto, another was one who was busted for inappropriate pictures of young children. And in my conversations with both of them as to how they got to the brink of destruction and the, the horrible choices that they made, there was a common pattern with both of them. See, both of them, the, the one that... Uh, did Grand Theft Auto? It started when he was a little kid and just taking money from his parents, and they never got caught. And then he goes to the convenience store, and he takes from a convenience store, and even if he got in trouble, he just got a little hand smack, and, and that was it. And it just kept growing and growing and growing, and the next thing you know, you're in jail for Grand Theft Auto. The same thing with the man who got busted for inappropriate pictures. It all started with a newspaper sales ad and a, 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 you know, a lingerie sale. And that started this cycle that then looking for stuff on the internet, that didn't satisfy the beast inside. So looking for worse, horrible, dark things on the internet in that same category. And one thing led to another and then you're sitting in the courtroom because of the baby steps to destruction. Here's another thing. All of us, because of our constant wrestle with sin, are somewhere along the process of baby steps to something bigger. I am. Anger. Anger can have the best of me. It can lead me to do horrible things, and I have to frequently examine myself that I keep my anger in check, that I replace it with something else. Because if I don't, and I leave it unchecked, or I say it's not that big a deal it will inevitably grow and lead to something else. And all of us have those areas. Maybe it's just the words in our mouth. We don't consider ourselves a person that destroys people's character or, you know, gossip or, or a divisive person, but we're taking those early steps. If we're truly watching our steps, we have those areas of weakness. All of us do. It's a battle for our life. But we must learn how to master it. As God told Cain, two ways that we can do this, and these aren't silver bullets here. There's a lot of you know, things that we can do to help in this journey to begin to stop the baby steps of destruction. These are nothing new, but they're often things we don't treat seriously enough. Self-examination and accountability. Self-examination and accountability. Self-examination, let me explain this. Um, when we have prayer times, oftentimes when we get together and we do prayer together, it's all about hey, let's ask God for this, pray for this person, I need this, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing wrong with that. That's part of prayer. But how often do we have, you know what, I'm going to have a prayer time where I examine myself and lay my sins. I'm honest before God, not for 30 seconds at the beginning of a prayer, but a concentration of time where we're before the Lord, knowing we're forgiven if we have a relationship with him, but confessing our sins to him. God, I'm struggling with this. I gotta be honest. I need help. 
a, con- a concentrated time of self-examination. We have to be honest to confront the brutal facts in our life. And here's the other thing, accountability, we need people that are going to help us see the brutal facts of our life. Point out, David didn't have this. Joab could have maybe said something about, do you realize what you're doing here? You're about to be a murderer and an adulterer. This isn't good. Joab doesn't. We need accountability in our life. Now, I, I've been in the church many years, and, and over the last 25 years, everyone talked about having an accountability partner. Dan, do you have an accountability partner? Do you have an accountability partner? Do you have an accountability partner? Here's what the accountability partners most of the time in my life became. They were a person I got together with and did breakfast uh, every once in a while, and we talked about the Phillies or the Eagles. We didn't touch, and I wanted to. He never asked me, or they never asked me, the hard questions even ones that may make me, hey, come on, lay off. Something that would make me squirm and uncomfortable. But I knew that they were doing that because they loved me and they wanted the best out of me and they wanted to stop the process of destruction in my life. That's the kind of accountability partner you need. Not one that's gonna coax you or enable you and say, oh, I understand, you do have it so bad. But someone that's gonna say, stop. Stop before it's too late and I'm gonna keep telling you to stop before it's too late because I love you and I wanna help you get on the right path. Do you have that in your life? My challenge this morning is this. Be honest about your journey before you reach the destination. Be honest about your journey. This may be a time of reflection this week that you spend evaluating yourself maybe with a close friend who will be honest, is going to point into your life for the sole purpose of helping you be more like Jesus. The beauty of this is this. Uh, we can't use this self-examination time as a poor me, I'm a horrible person, you know, uh, I am but a worm in thy presence, O Lord. You know, uh, that, that's not my point of this, because here's why. You have a relationship with Jesus, you've been forgiven of those. He loves you that much that no matter how many times I fail him, he stays faithful to me. And he loves me. And he wants the best for me. He wants shalom again. Complete peace, complete unity, complete justice. He wants it all to be the way it was supposed to be. He wants that because he loves us. Take that journey this week, a time of self-examination, reflecting on the promises of God and striving to live to be like Jesus this week. Let's pray. God, sometimes you put road signs in front of us saying you're going the wrong way. Stop signs. And Lord, too often, sometimes we think it's not that big a deal that we run the stop sign uh, towards destruction and we we just barge through it and we keep moving and and Lord, you know all of us in some area, whether it's with our mouths, whether it's our thoughts of negativity, we're starting that journey. And Lord, you help us to live righteous. You put your Holy Spirit in our hearts to convict us of sin. You put people in our lives to help us on this journey that we can avoid the path to destruction before it's too late. Lord, this week, as the psalmist says, see if there's any evil intent in me. Reveal it to us. Lord, and may we not minimize it as, oh, it's not that big a deal, or oh, I deserve this, or whatever any of the excuses we may come up with. But Lord, may we see it as what it is. It's a poison, it is a beast waiting to dominate our lives. And Jesus, give us the victory that you give us. Thank you for that victory. We do not have to be defeated by it. We can master it with your help. We can overcome it with your help. May we live in victory this week, Jesus. We ask this in your name.